Hello, I'm uh, Nick Stoy from Stoy Productions, a production services company based in Brazil. We, off, uh, we offer all kinds of support for film crews that come and shoot in this very large country. And we are starting a tradition to interview the filmmakers that we have the chance to serve. Today we'll be uh, talking about Connected, the hidden science of everything, a documentary series presented by uh, Latif Nasser that has just launched on Netflix earlier this month. So I'm very, very happy to welcome Elise Walsh, uh, producer, director, and uh, Christopher Gill, uh, DOP. And uh, actually, they are a couple, uh, which is uh, great. Um, so uh, Elise, uh, let's start with Elise. And um, please introduce yourself, where you come from, what's your background in filmmaking, and how you ended up on this project. Sure. Um, thank you for having me. My name's Elise Walsh, and I was the director on two episodes of Connected. Um, and I work as a producer and director on various documentary series um, for different streaming services and networks like Netflix and Apple TV Plus and YouTube Premium and things like that. Um, and my career began um, really more on the journalism side of things. I went to journalism school and started out as a reporter, ended up working in documentary, um, and I worked for several years um, at Vice Media in New York, working on international news stories for a documentary program that aired on HBO. And after that, I sort of transitioned into working on different uh, nonfiction series, which are becoming more and more popular right now. Um, and so series like Connected um, will reach out to me and see if I'm interested in coming on as a producer or director. Um, I'm based in Los Angeles right now, but I'm from the New York area. Um, and I think that's it, that's my intro. Thank you very much. Chris, Yeah. Yes. You, you know, what's your background and um, how did you end up behind the camera and, and on this project? Yeah, um, so I'm a, uh, I'm a freelance DP. I've been, I kind of haven't really had like a, a professional job that wasn't um, in the camera world. So I, I've been doing this for almost a, a decade. Um, and I kind of got started, I, I was really lucky. I had a really good uh, high school AV program actually. and got an early introduction into filmmaking at a young age. And I think it's kind of a common tale amongst some camera people. You, you make like skate videos with your friends and that's kind of your, your entryway into the world. And I was just kind of shown that you could do this professionally and that it, it you know, it's a, it's a, a job that is real and people have and do and um, was always really intrigued by it. So just kind of pursued it and, um, kind of knew that I wanted to be in camera and um, just kind of, you know, one thing fell into place after the other. And I started shooting um, for Vice early on in my career and, and got onto the show that Elise worked on as well, their HBO show. And um, yeah, just kind of kept going from there. Just I mostly work in, in uh, documentary and nonfiction television as well. Um, and yeah, I kind of, I, I got on to Connected because I had had a, a working relationship with ZPZ, the, the production company um, that created it. Um, for a number of years, I worked on another show that, that they produced called Meat Eater, which is like a hunting backcountry food show. Um, and so I kind of knew a lot of people and, you know, my name was circulating in their world for a while. And then Elise got on to direct it. And we just kind of worked together. No, it wasn't because of me, though. They called you first. That's they right. They called him first. Yeah, yeah, that's they right. called me later. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but I should add how I got onto Connected. I yeah. also, I had never worked with ZPZ before, 0.0 .0 Productions. Um, but the head of development at ZPZ is a guy named Eric Osterholm. Um, and he really developed this show with Latif 
the two of them created it and got it off the ground. And Eric and I worked together many years ago. We actually did a bunch of uh, work in Afghanistan together um, many years back. And so he called me up to see if I might be able to, to direct for ZPZ on this. And that's how it happened. Yeah, I think Eric was also my intro because I, he had worked for, for Vice as well. And I'd worked with him there. And he'd also done some of the, that hunting show. So he kind of, we knew each other through that. It's a very, very ambitious uh, show the um, connected show <laughs> you have, you just jump from one place of the globe to another um how did you find it was it challenging how did you organize it how crazy was it let tell me tell us everything it was um first of all the whole concept of the show was developed by the host latif nasser um this idea of creating um episodes where you follow things that are connected to each other and you sort of bounce from the next place to the next place. Um, that's all his research, it's all his idea. He's an um, incredibly smart guy who comes up with really creative ways to, to talk about science. And, um, and it was a very ambitious um, film project. Um, he normally works in podcasts. He's a radio host on a very popular program called Radio Lab. And it's funny because I think it would be a very easy thing to do as a podcast because you could just call people in all of these different places. But doing this as a film, it was incredibly challenging and, um, and very expensive to, to be moving crews to all these different locations. So it was certainly an ambitious project. Um, when I came on board, um, I had a very small time window to accomplish all the things that we needed to for the two episodes that I was directing. And so it really was just moving from one country to the next country, the next country. I was on the road for about two months straight with very small breaks in between, if any breaks in between. Um, and, you know, a lot of the locations were really challenging. Um, before we filmed in Brazil with you, we filmed um, part of the same episode in um, in Chad, in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Um, we also had filmed right before that in South Africa for a different episode. So we bounced from South Africa straight to Chad and had an extremely um, sort of rough time of working in, in 120 degrees and hotter. There's no hotels, there's no anything, you have to camp. Um, and you have to drive all the way into the middle of this desert. So if anything goes wrong, you're pretty stranded. Um, and then not long after we were finished with that, which was very challenging in a number of ways, we bounced over to, to Brazil. And as you know, where we went in Brazil is very remote. And it took a lot of different modes of transportation to even get to the location, um, let alone climbing up the, the tower at Atto, which I'm sure you'll probably ask about. <laughs> and, uh, how did you find this character, the, um, uh, the scientist in Chad? Because he's very, uh, very nice. Uh, he's a very warm character. And you really, you know, the first character you see is, you know, uh, Latif is nice, but the other guy who's just showing in the middle of the desert is that, you know, is a warm, lovable character. So um, did you, I mean, so you had to change those characters. How did you do, do that? Yeah, well, I have to give a lot of credit to the producer who worked with me, Caroline Cannon. Um, she, was, she is an incredible producer, and she did a lot of the, the legwork on some of that. But the dust in, in Chad is studied by a lot of different scientists. This is our dog. Sorry, she's going to be <laughs> present during this. Um, there are a lot of scientists from many different countries that study that dust. Um, from European countries and from the Americas as well. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of people that we talk to to really understand the subject and do the research in the background. Um, but we really wanted to go there with someone from Chad um, who really knows the place, who really has a relationship with the desert and with what all of that means. Um, do you want to give, give her? her a little chew stick? We're gonna, Excuse me, one moment. We're going to give our dog a bone, quite literally. Um, 
But yeah, so when we started doing the research, um, we came across uh, Musa. Uh, his name is Musa Abdurrahman. He's the, the professor um, from the university in Chad who, um, who went with us. And he was an incredible person. He was so warm and welcoming. And he also, being local, he facilitates a lot of research trips for other scientists to go to that location. And there's very, very, very few people on the planet who know how to get there and what the conditions are like and what it means and the kind of crew you need and the supplies you need. And he does that all the time with, or not all the time, a few times a year, he does that with other research groups. And so we were able to use his help in getting our crew there too, because this isn't something that even a lot of, you know, there aren't, first of all, there aren't companies like yours um, really in Chad, there just isn't really a film industry there. And so it wasn't like we could call up a great fixer and, and have them say, oh yeah, I know how to get there. This is what we have to do. There's no one to do that there. Um, and so Musa was kind of both our subject, but also really a wonderful guide to Chad. And he was able to connect us with drivers and translators and all the people that we would need to make the production happen too. And one thing about that, which logistically was more challenging than, than Brazil, in addition to not having a company like your company to help us out, it was we had to have a military escort by the Chadanian army. And uh, that's because when we, the, the route that you take to get out to the Baudelaire Depression is a bit of a, a conflict zone. It's not, you know, there's not fighting happening right now, but there has been fighting and um, there's a fairly real threat of Boko Haram um, that, you know, they just try to disrupt whatever they can. So that was an interesting addition to it. Yeah, our... he was, Musa was also able to connect us with the military to, to help keep us safe. Um, but yeah, he's a wonderful person. He's really great. an amazing scientist. He goes out there and, and does that work looking for fossils and, and studying the dust. Um, and uh, I'm sure he doesn't get a whole lot of recognition because I think that the, the studies and the papers tend to be published um, in English um, by Europeans mostly, and he doesn't always get the recognition that he probably deserves, but he's wonderful. The, um, I have a question uh, on the episode. You have Latif understands French or... or... Let you speak French, or uh, because there was a conversation between French and English, and uh, where Latif is answering, and uh, there's yeah. a very long. It's a, something I, I mean, I, I like a lot this idea of you know you, you speak a language, we understand, we answer in our language. Totally, yeah. Well, Latif does have a little bit of French in his background, and he was able to frequently understand Musa. But I also speak fluent French, and so I was the translator most of the time. So. Um, when they're sitting there having that interview, I was sitting right next to them translating the questions and the answers back and forth to help. But, but lots of understood him a lot of the time anyway, because he, he took French at some point in his education. So on, we, uh, on that documentary, we see um, a, a huge convoy. I mean, it's about five vans going through the desert with this very arid texture, which you... Have, uh, you have a drone. So how big was the crew in Chad and did you have the same size of crew in Brazil? How did you, uh, did you have a lot of security in Chad? Um, yeah, we had, we had um, a much bigger group of people in Chad because we had to camp. And so there were people that were um, helping to set up the camp and also cooking. There's no kitchen, there's no electricity. Um, so, you know, we, we had a generator that I don't think it actually worked in the end, the generator, no, but yeah, we, had, broke a lot. we had a lot of supplies and things that needed to be brought out there. Um, so it ended up being a lot of people, um, more people than on any of the other shoots, I think that we did. So a much bigger group, but, but most of the time in terms of the actual filming, it was just a few of us, you know, it was myself and Chris, Caroline, lots of, of course, and our sound recordist, whose name is Doug Martin. Um, so we, the five of us would be out, and, and Musa too. So the and six Miriam. of us would be out. Oh, and Miriam, our second camera yeah, operator. Um, 
we would be out in the desert filming throughout the day and they would be taking care of the logistical things like food and, and camp and stuff like that. But it was a big convoy. Um, and yeah, one of those trucks was the military escort that Chris was describing too. Yeah. And I think at some point we just kind of embraced seeing all the cars you know, we never tried to pretend like it's just Latif and Musa out in one Land Rover cruising in the Sahara. It was like, you know, we just recognized that, that this was kind of a big expedition. And also, we, we, when we were on the trip out to our destination, we couldn't really stop because the military was constantly worried about a, a threat from Boko Haram. So they just wanted to get to where we were going as fast as we could. So... The shots, we didn't have much opportunity to shoot um, the journey as we would have liked to because, um, yeah, they, they were pretty adamant about once we're moving, we're moving. So we tried to, to steal what we could when we stopped at like yeah. a roadside oasis and, and other, you know, little it, pit stops. It's hard to really explain how extreme the environment is there. Um, it's so hot that really we only had – a few hours in the morning and a few hours in the evening when we could film the middle of the day it's too hot to for the cameras to even work and it's definitely too hot for human beings to be running around and doing um you know carrying heavy equipment and um straining themselves in any way we all got at some point on that journey everyone on the crew was uh seriously dehydrated um, and we, we did have a wonderful um, medic and security person named Dean Smith who came with us in both Brazil and in Chad, and he had some medical supplies. Um, at one point, Chris had to drink an entire bag of IV fluid because he was so dehydrated. Um, and that, yeah, it was, it was dangerously hot. And one of the other main qualities of the environment there, which you learn about in the documentary, is that it's incredibly windy. That's what carries the dust up into the atmosphere and sails it across the world to you. Um, and so that wind is hard to work in. Our whole camp blew over one day, and that was our only source of shade during the middle of the day, during those high heat hours. And so we had to drive to uh, a really random small oasis of trees, and we all had to lay under the trees like together like sardines for – like five hours mm -hmm. until the sun started to go down. Um, so we would get up at like three o'clock in the morning, start shooting. It was light out by five, by 4.30 or five. Yeah. We would shoot in the morning until like nine, nine thirty, and then it was too hot. And then we'd have to wait until the evening. So it was a very extreme, extreme shoot, I would say. Because I think we had, we had calls and you were there I don't know. I, I remember having a call, and you you sounded exhausted. I remember uh, people sounding exhausted. So this is the memory I have. It's it's some time back. You had to get. You you were incredibly hard. The the cameras were not working. When did you did you have a long siesta? I mean, uh, what, what happened yeah. between uh, from like nine thirty a.m. until like four p.m. It's like the whole day and you know there's also not much to do it's not like you can be preparing other things or typing or working there's no cell phone service there's no electricity um no, you really just huddle under a the only piece of shade that you can find and the only depression in the ground that you can find because the entire day it's just roasting hot and then it's blowing Blowing sand. Probably, in your face. yeah, gusting like 40 to 50 miles an hour. And then, you know, you just, we wore goggles and yeah, it, it was. We can send you some photos. There's some pretty amazing photographs of this group of trees that are in the middle of, literally the middle of the desert. There's nothing else in sight. And we we're all like little sardines under this tree. And we were trying to take naps because we were really exhausted from, from you know, being up so early and working such long hours and also just trying to stay hydrated. We were just drinking a lot of water, um, but it was, it was hard. <laughs> How did you keep, um, I mean, there's one thing that on the technical side, you had to keep the cameras rolling and uh, there's the, the challenge on the on one side. The other one is keeping everybody in good mood because you need to have Latif happy um, and, uh, 
because you, you need to have, you know, you need to tell the story. And so how do you do that? Does it, was there a happy feeling or was it what you go, oh, no, we're all suffering. Um, well, because Latif, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a chemistry happening between Latif and the, uh, and the scientists. Love is um, one of those rare people who's extremely optimistic, extremely um, uh, personable, and manages to have a good attitude all the time. So we're very lucky in that way that he, uh, you know, is, I think that we were probably more stressed at times than he was. He has a, a great personality and a great sense of keeping morale up. So um, I didn't really have to worry about Latif too much. Um, no, he was pretty. He was pretty excited about everything that we were doing and experiencing, which is it, it's, it's it's like so refreshing to work with an on camera person like that because you know the crew were were working and and doing a very physical job and and when not everybody on the team is, is not there with us. It's, you know, it can drain you even more and to have Latif being as optimistic and, and just like genuinely. Sorry, should we stop for a second? Should we feed her? Yeah, I did already. She's, she's pretty Sorry bad. that our dog is doing this. I'm gonna get her a treat, I'll be right back. Okay. I don't know if you're editing this, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you can leave it in. Um, yeah, Latif is just, he's, he's just, just a really unique and special person in that way where he can go into these situations and just, you know, not think about how bad he wants a cold shower or how bad he wants a cheeseburger or something that, you know, can take over the minds of, of people that, that aren't used to that kind of travel. And, and he just dove right into it and was super excited the whole way. And so um, the crews that, that I usually work with and, and a part of we kind of also just have that attitude but when you're working with somebody new especially on camera talent you don't know if they're also going to bring that sort of level of excitement to to a new experience and for him to do that was it really i think helped in, in the overall success of just us getting the story that we needed to get and the the content that he delivered for the show and lots of genuinely has always wanted to go there. He, you know, he had reported this story and wanted to tell this story about the Baudelaire depression and about this amazing Saharan dust for a long time. And so this is a bit of a dream come true for him to be there. So he was really excited. Um, not to say that it wasn't hard for him too, but he had a great attitude throughout the whole yeah. process. And I think as a producer and director, I think a lot about who I'm bringing on these trips with me because I have worked with a lot of people over the years and um, you know you know what type of person can handle situations like that and you know some people really can't and, or don't want to um, and so the team that we put together Miriam and Doug our second camera and our sound person they're both amazing and Doug has been to just about every country in the world I knew that he would be somebody that would be great to bring along. So, you know, you think about these things before you hire. There's something about the script uh, and the way that Latif tells the story, because he's actually, in, he's saying that he leads us along this little fish that we're all expecting to have a real fish and it's a dead fish. Um, so um, when you are, how much of the script is prepared before? I mean, uh, or is it something that you know, did you think of all the script in New York and we're going to do that? And then, or is it something, uh, you know, that you, you, that's on the spur of the moment? Tell us about that, the script part in this difficult environment. It's a bit of both. We, I definitely wrote an inner treatment and script for the episode before we went anywhere or started rolling any cameras. Um, again, Latif is the person who came up with the full trajectory. There were some scenes and some of the connections that, you know, we would research or pitch new ideas and, and figure out if there were new things we could inject into his initial idea to make it even stronger. But from the start, and this one in particular, the dust one was one that he had um, really thought out. So a lot of the connections already laid out and then figuring out how to make them visually interesting is where I come in and I was able to write out, you know, the, the order of things and the script. Um, but of course it changes. So then when you get somewhere, Latif has great ideas of things to say on camera. He might come up with something on the fly that 
is really smart or funny and that ends up making it in. And also, of course, you end up going on location and you end up filming things you didn't know you would get or you don't get things you wanted to. And so you, you adjust and you edit as you go. But, but we did really think it through before we left. We thought a lot about um, sort of the whole narrative arc of incorporating his journey into this one. This, out of all the episodes, this one um, required the most travel around the world. And so we wanted to incorporate Lot Tip's journey into it so that he's kind of really going on a journey with the dust and you get a sense that he's sort of chasing it around the planet and he's going through the same thing that this dust does as it travels across the globe. Um, and so we wanted there to be more journey present, um, whereas normally you don't see him getting on airplanes or, you know, he's just there wherever he is to interview somebody. Um, but knowing that there were going to be hard journeys, um, both in Brazil and in Chad, we wanted to make that part of the story. And we probably could have done it more because it was, really challenging in chat, but obviously there's only um, so many minutes to, that you have on air. So we had to uh, eliminate some of that in the edit room, I'm sure. Thinking about the, the journey, I have a suggestion. You could have put Latif on a balloon to catch up <laughs> Sam in the mid-Atlantic. I would have um, yeah. So we, we, uh, it's now raining, it's uh, we're at the end of uh, winter, and this is the dust from the Chad raining on, in Brazil. Right. That's right. Uh, we have, and I, it, it is actually, you knows it. It's the, it comes over the Amazon and comes down to the south of Brazil in Sao Paulo. How did we plan Brazil? Because you were cooking in Chad, and we had to organize this thing uh, in the Ato Town, which is stuck in the, in the middle. So how did it all happen? Well, Atto was a location that, um, that we knew about and uh, we really wanted to go there and thought it was obviously the best place to see people and talk to people who are actually trying to study this dust that's falling into the Amazon rainforest. It's also, you know, just an outrageous structure, the tallest structure in all of South America from what I understand. And um, so we really wanted to go there. Um, but access wasn't super easy. You know, they, they're very busy. They're also um, not that many people that work out there and, and bringing a big crew out there is a big deal. You know, it's, it's disrupting their normal, um, the normal things they have going on there and the research that they're doing. And um, the scientists there were incredible and they were so welcoming, but scheduling was very difficult because they are incredibly busy with all the work that they're doing. So. We had to find the exact right time where we could go, where they didn't already have another group of scientists there. And um, as you know, traveling there is very complicated. There's, there's buses and boats and all different things you have to do, and they don't run at all times of the day. It's not like you can call a cab or that there's a bus schedule to get there. You have to have it very coordinated. So. Um, we got in touch with them and again, Caroline Cannon, the producer, did a ton of work to build a relationship with those scientists and eventually we were able to find a date, a uh, group of dates that worked for Latif and worked for us and worked for them and then we, um, we just went for it. So on our side, uh, we did a lot of, uh, we had to picture the trip uh, ourselves because uh, it, was all, uh, it was the first time we produced uh, um, at the Atto Town, which is actually a key, uh, it's a very big, it's a very important research center. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember um, Stefan was telling us, you know, it has to be, being German, you know, everything has to be super organized, and it has to be then, you have to leave now. And you, uh, I think you had the, the, you didn't need all the security that you had in chat, but there's a lot of things um, yeah. that had to be done. Well, it's funny you say that because, yeah, a lot of the scientists there are German because they have an affiliation with the Max Planck Institute in Germany, and, um, and Stefan obviously is German, and so, yeah, it's very German. It's very organized, and uh, that's very helpful because it keeps things moving on time. One of the key challenges, if I remember correctly, is going up this tower, which is bigger than the Eiffel Tower. Yeah. How did you organize that? Um, well, we can talk about what it was actually like going up it, but when we were trying to organize it, um, you know, we got 
we asked everyone at Atto and we asked your, your team who had been scouting it and everything. I mean, once you guys took over, it was so helpful because we'd been sort of doing all of this liaising with the people at Atto. But once we had your Brazilian team who could just start communicating with them directly, it made our lives so much easier. Um, and so your team was wonderful about getting all that information. Like, how long does it actually take for a person to walk up the tower? And is there an elevator? And how many, you know, how many amps do they have in the, you know, what kind of electricity is there? Is there running water? So your team kind of took that over for us at a certain point in our planning once we had the dates decided. And that was huge. Um, but in terms of actually planning how to film it, once I knew how long it took to get up it and how taxing it is, plus carrying camera equipment, I knew that we couldn't go up and down many times. And they told us that too. You know, you go up once and you come down once pretty much in a day. Um, and it, it took about an hour um, to climb, it up, climb up it just as a regular person walking up that tower. Um, and with the cameras and with the things, the different angles and shots we wanted to get, we knew it would take a lot longer than an hour because you're stopping and you're adjusting and, and all of that. And so, um, so I just mapped it out. I just, you know, thought about what are the various shots we want to get? You know, we want to see Latif walking in with Stefan and we want to get a shot, a wider shot from further back where you can see them real small walking up the tower. Then you also want some shots right behind them that Chris would get, you know, handheld of their feet and of their conversation and seeing them struggling. And, you know, so there were so many different angles that we wanted to get, but we only had really one journey up it to do it. So we had walkie talkies and we just, we made a plan and made a whole timeline of, okay, we're going to film this part for the first half an hour and then they're going to stop and then we'll you know have lincoln send the drone up and we'll do drone shots for another 15 minutes and then we'll stop and then we'll you know chris will go and catch up with them um so they had to wait for like 30 minutes for him to get up to where they were and then do some handheld so that chris wasn't in the shots when the drone was flying so it was just thinking through all of those little pieces so that we could get all the various angles and shots and um and make it happen but uh it was really hard i mean it's it's really exhausting going up and uh yeah you can you can talk a little bit about it too i'm sure yeah i mean from a filming standpoint it was yeah logistically challenging for all the reasons that elise laid out um but with with brazil with this in particular the tower and chad one thing that was really beneficial um, to us like executing on the on the ground in the field was the shot list that you and Caroline had come up with prior to, to even leaving the country. And normally, you know, we work at a lot in documentary and, and nonfiction and, and that can be very verite driven where you kind of show up and, and you just capture the scene as it unfolds. So it's, it's not always intuitive for directors to be like, oh, I actually need to structure this like a narrative even though this is still nonfiction um, and that approach was really helpful to us. And so when I came on board, we talked about like what things we wanted to get and, you know, and you kind of just do broad strokes until you get there. And then you see like, okay, here's the tower and there's the sun in relation to the tower. And you, and you find out all these, these variables that you were wondering about in your head before you're there. And then you start to structure the shots around what you're discovering. And so, yeah, I think we started the day probably with them discovering the tower and, and, and seeing it for the first time and their, gen, you know, their, their reaction and Latif, his funny line of being like, is there an elevator or whatever? I forgot what he said, but, you know, that was, I think, the, the first part of the day. And then, yeah, like Elise said, I filmed them going up and then we, yeah, Lincoln flew the drone and got some amazing drone footage of the tower. He's an extremely talented drone operator. He's really good. Um, and one thing that's very difficult about flying a drone next to the tower is there's a lot of guy wires that come out that are invisible when you're flying it. You know, you can see them when you're, when you're up close to it, but when you're flying on the drone on the monitor, you can't see it. And so he was very, you know, he, he knew where those things were and was able to, to fly around it. And he got some really, really stunning work. Um, and yeah, logistically it's tough because yeah, you have to jump ahead of them. It's hot. You're carrying the gear. 
Um, there's the safety issue of, of the scientists at ATO want you to be clipped in um, to their safety chain as you're climbing it. And you want to be clipped in as well, because if you did fall, it would be very, very bad. So there's, there's just, there was a little bit of like, we have to move quick to make our day, but we also need to move slow. So we're being safe and, and yeah, it yeah. was, it was challenging. And actually we should mention that our other camera operator, Josh Fieser, who um, came out with us is the only person on the crew that, that climbed the tower twice because we wanted to try to capture some time lapses. And the only thing we had to do that, that the budget and time would afford was, was some GoPros rigged with like an external battery pack. And, we had to film something on the ground. I forgot what now. I'm sure we were working. Um, no, we did. Yeah, we really did have to film some scene. But Josh had to go up and rig these GoPros. So he went up one the day before we actually did the climb on camera with Latif. Um, he went up and rigged all the GoPros. I think, then, I think Lottie went up twice, too. Yeah, she did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. Because yeah. Lottie, who is one of your wonderful fixers that worked with us, um, she, she went, went up two Josh, days right? in a row yeah. to help Josh with yeah. all the GoPros and everything. So she was tough. She, she got the workout. Yeah. I, I, so there is a story. I don't know if you know about this or we're going to ask us about this, but did you know about the, the lightning storm that came in when we were at the top of the tower? No. Tell us. So once we got to the top and we're filming our scene, and Latif and, and Stefan are appreciating this beauty, but also talking about the science and the dust and everything. Um, as we're there, you can see clouds in the distance um, that are raining far away. And it's incredible to see and clouds forming. And um, we were just blown away. And then at one point, um, Stefan pointed out a group of clouds that were moving this way. And he he's a meteorologist, so he would know um, he was like, that's a, a lightning storm. That's, that's definitely going to be a thunderstorm. That cloud is going to produce lightning. So we're basically all standing on the highest lightning rod in all of South America. So it's really not a good thing to be on that tower when lightning strikes it. And it does strike it all the time, I'm told. So suddenly we really had to get off of it. And we had to hustle to get down. But remember, it took an hour to climb up. So it's going to take about that to get down. And um, I think we did it in like 25 minutes, though. We moved really fast because uh, we didn't want to get struck by lightning. <laughs> so it was really crazy going down. And we, you know, we were rushed. We didn't get absolutely everything we wanted to. But uh, we also didn't want to um, die up there. So we decided to, to hustle down. And um, yeah, that was stressful and hard and uh we did it in record time i think we basically ran down that thing with all of our camera equipment josh was grabbing the gopros as we were going down the tower um and we were fine nothing happened but it was a, a little bit of a close call um and i my i couldn't feel my legs for like a week after that experience my legs were extremely sore it was terrible there's a douglas a sound person that you uh, uh, that he uh, that works with us all the time, and um, he um, he told us about the sound issue because the Amazon produces uh, the forest produces a lot of sound a lot of sound. Um, yeah. Tell us about that. Well, I mean, the animals make a lot of noise. I remember at night. This wasn't when we were filming, but there were howler monkeys that are screaming all night long yeah. and, um just the sounds of the forest are are quite intense all the time um but we we managed really well i mean douglas was amazing he did an excellent job he's not just a sound person he's like an ac sort of just yeah, assistant extraordinaire did, to all departments he did a lot of heavy lifting in the camera department too because he he has a lot of experience in that as well he was he was invaluable to the shoot for sure yeah but do you want to talk about camera um yeah for for sound i don't remember the sound being too much of an issue i remember there was this one species of bird that would kind of like call out every like 10 minutes and anytime we're doing like an, an interview conversation like a dialogue scene you would just hear this like one distinct call and after a while it's like i, I you know we just embraced it and and the editors cut around it and did some audio magic and, and pulled it out. But, but yeah. 
in this series, uh, it starts with uh, all the, the points that Latif speaks and has his uh, pieces to camera, and they're all happening in the Amazon. Yeah. So you really, um, uh, because that's the, the, the whole, uh, the narrative is, you're yeah. not telling us anything uh, and then we realize he's in the Amazon, he's at the outer tower, this is the outer tower. So there's always, you're never revealing anything. Um, and uh, initially it looks like, oh, this is, this is a New York studio or something like that. No, this is actually really the Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. But those were, we called them monologues, and those were in every episode where lots of kind of walks you through everything. And, um, and he had the good idea of trying to keep those in the final location um, for each episode so that by the time you get to your last connection, your last location, you can reveal where he's been this whole time. Um, and I think it worked the best in, in our episode because, like you said, it was so surprising to learn that he's actually been sitting in the Amazon rainforest the whole time. Um, but I think it was also maybe the hardest one to do because... Definitely you know that that we shot that all day long you know there's a lot of lines and we're changing lines and we're redoing things and we're changing lenses to get different focal lengths and um so that's an all-day shoot and obviously shooting outside all day long the sun is moving all day long and it's the rainforest so it also starts raining at various points uh yeah. during the day um, so that was a really hard one to pull off and Chris did an amazing, and Josh did an amazing job, um, setting up basically like a tent around Latif sitting in the jungle so that we could control the light and also protect the cameras from the rain and, and stuff like that. But you should talk more about that. Yeah, it was a, the setup, um, it was a big setup because and we got very lucky with that day because it was overcast and it stayed overcast the entire day. Um, but I think if my memory serves me right, I think we, we flew like a 12 by 12 frame with diffusion overhead over Latif, which, I mean, you guys were amazing in getting a 12 by frame that far out into the middle of nowhere. Um, and we, we, yeah, had diffusion on that. So in case the sun did come out, it wouldn't all of a sudden just like start, you know, ripping on him. So we had a little bit of a safety net there, but then it luckily it held. Um, and yeah, so then we had to, we had to build, there was a fair amount of like front fill coming in off of the place that we were filming because we had to stay, we wanted to, to see the jungle, but we had to stay close to the Atto like compound because we needed power to power lights. And I think maybe we powered cameras and didn't go off battery power. They also, just to interject quickly, the scientists didn't really want us wandering too far into the jungle because there are tons of poisonous creatures yeah. in there. So, like, we're these city people from the U.S. who, like, don't know anything about snakes and spiders. And I think they're very worried we might get bitten by something yeah. deadly if we wandered off too far by yeah. ourselves. So we had to stay they're pretty like, close. They're like, you're going to, this is, this is kind of the limit. <laughs> so, yeah, we had to build, like, a bunch of, I built like a bunch of negative fill on the front side out of as much diff as we could. And, and I think we ended up using like giant contractor bags at one point. We got very crafty, um, but it, yeah, it turned out. One consistency issue, which is challenging about those as well, is the, the master, the A shot is, it's two shots. There's one on like a 24 mil and I believe a 50 mil. Um, and it's, it's kind of slowly tracking along and you guys had to remember which direction the camera's tracking. So when Latif needs to do another take, it can, he can intercut, the editor can intercut those, those takes. So it's not, you know, one's not going this way and the other's not going that way. And you can't, you have the, like a crazy jump cut. So it was, yeah, it was logistically tough, but we got lucky because the rest of the time we were there, it was like, ripping sun all day long and i remember seeing it the day after we shot the interview where we shot it and it was just like a giant spotlight right in that spot it changed throughout the day so it was really it was we got lucky with it for sure yeah how do you deal with the um, uh, the humidity for the for the kit and the lenses um was it um 
in Ato, it's you're always outside. I mean, it, you're sleeping in hammocks. Um, yeah. so you're not really, you're not going from a very cold place to a very hot place. But did you have issues with the um, uh, humid, uh, humidity in the lenses? We never really did. It's like sometimes if you put a lens cap on or, or close the, the flag on the matte box and you open it up, that can cause a little condensation. But everything was pretty normalized in temperature because, like you mentioned, it's, it's, you're just outside the whole time. So the cameras, you know, fluctuate with the outside temperature, the ambient temperature. So, I mean, aside from just working conditions and, and being very sweaty all day, it wasn't – the gear stood up pretty good. And we've brought, we shot that show um, on the FS7 and we've, I'm, I've brought that camera into very extreme environments and it's always, it's always done pretty well. It's not, I've never had one of those go down for, for it being too warm or too cold or too humid. What are your lenses that you like to work with? Uh, sorry, Elise. That's a... No, I've spoken enough. Um, I, I, I typically, for dock work, I typically like to use a cinema zoom. Um, I like manual control on the iris zoom and focus. Um, it just allows you to, to pull focus in a more natural way than, than the, the stills lenses. I think the, the stills glass, you can kind of, you know, if you have an eye for it, you can kind of see when, when people are shooting on it because there's just a lot of focus hunting. And the cinema zooms are, you're able to, to um to just be more accurate with your movements um they also add a nice weight to the camera and, and we're usually shooting handheld so you don't have you know it's more exhausting throughout the day but you just lose a lot of that shake and your movements are very you're able to control them more which is which is beneficial um and it, and the glass just looks nice um for connected we had a we had a mix um of the fuji MK series, which is a very budget friendly um, lenses that were, I think, designed for E-mount, so for the FS7. And those were, those were important to us because we couldn't really take like, a, you know, an Ingenue or a Cabrio, you know, you wouldn't want to climb that tower with, with a six to seven pound lens. So those lenses are very light while still giving you that manual control. Um, so they, yeah, they really worked out for us for the series. They were nice. And then I think we also had a set of, um, just a set of Rokinon primes, nothing crazy high budget or, or anything that was, you know, really extreme because we were traveling so much and just kind of abusing so much of that gear that you wouldn't really want to take. And we also didn't have a dedicated AC. So all of our camera support was just, myself or, or one of the other very talented series DPs on it um, and our other camera operators. We, you know, we did a lot of that, that work. So we, we didn't want to burden ourselves with, with too much gear and too much, you know, stuff. And when you overdo it a little bit on gear, you end up, I think, impacting what you're able to get in the day and then you're not able to get, you're not able to capture the story. Well, there were limitations, too, on how many cases we could even feasibly bring into that right. dip into the Amazon. And your team helped us figure that out because the team at Atto has a certain number of small boats that you take down the river. Um, and we had one boat that was filled with gear and then another boat with us in it. Um, but, you know, you can't, there's only so many cases you can fit into these small boats. So we had to keep that in mind. And we actually, for both the, the shoot in Chad and the shoot in the Amazon, Chris went through our usual gear list for Connected and he pared it way down to make it a much smaller kit because these two shoots in particular were so difficult in terms of travel and we were going to such remote places. Um, and to your point about, you know, having a small crew and having um, a lot of work to do with the gear and, and Chad in particular, the dust and the sand, it was impossible to keep those lenses from getting filled with dust and sand. Um, so yeah. I, I think we, I told, you know, I remember emailing the people back at ZPZ to say, you're going to need to get these lenses professionally cleaned after the shoot. Well, I think, Sorry. One, <laughs> I think one shot we did in Chad was, which we, we took like a clear, we had a matte box on the lens and we took like just a clear filter dropped in in front of the matte box and then, 
put sand intentionally all over the camera. And then lots of then dusted it off. And brushes yeah. it away, which then, maybe in the series. It's, it's in the show, yeah, so. It's, it's oh, yeah. Yeah. They, they also had a very nice shot of uh, Natif where he's pretending that we're looking for a fish. So he, there's a camera inside the water. And uh, so you, you have uh, the Oh, yeah, that was, yeah, that's at the Oasis. Yeah, I don't know if we got in trouble for putting that camera in there. I feel like it was okay. It was just a GoPro. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that one was okay in the water. But, um, yeah, we, we were pretty tough on the gear on these shoots, and we did our best to keep it all in the best condition possible. But we also needed to do a good job. And, um, you know, it yeah. involved getting a little dirty and a little dusty. Yeah. There are two things. I, there's one image that really I really found – uh, very very nice is really Latif walking on the globe so please tell me how you did this and uh, another one is I uh, congratulations on the on how the forest comes out because it's actually not easy to film forest uh, because yeah. you, know, you can very easily come out green um, so two things you can tell me about um, yeah the 360 cam um, I think that was a concept that one of the other, so there was a couple like DPs on the show that that um, shot in as well, and I, I joined the project. I think after them. I think um, you might have actually been one of the other directors on the show. Oh, okay. Nick, who really wanted to use that 360 cam, right? Okay. Um, and they started experimenting with it. Um, what is that camera called? Yeah, it's like the Insta three. It's like I think just called the Insta three hundred and sixty, and it's like pretty easy to use. A couple of companies make a similar thing. Like I think GoPro makes one. I forget what the name is now, but it's it's pretty simple, and you can use it with a phone or without a phone. You just it has like a very rudimentary menu, and you just go through and kind of set it up, much like a GoPro, and you just roll on it. And it's kind of like one of those things where you're like, I hope we're getting it. And if you have the phone, if you have the app, you can see it allows you to like tweak. It doesn't, you know, it just captures it how it captures it, like a crazy looking file. But it, in the phone, it lets you in real time adjust that globe effect. So you can do it like a little bit or a lot. And I think they call it like a tiny planet effect. Um, and it's pretty cool. We, I mean, we did it a ton. And, you know, some locations work better than others. Like indoors gets a little tough because things start to, warp and get weird i think outside is probably the yeah. best like i think we did it on the tower but i don't think it really worked that well because all the the the, the rods and the steel just end up mixing and it gets pretty weird um but he, we did one where we put him on a camel and chad and, and he used it walking around he used it i think on the boat yeah, yeah. i used yeah we used it on the boat i used it on the other episode that i directed which is about clouds we used it in Wales um, on a boat, and that had a really cool effect because he's sort of zooming on the right. speedboat, and then the world kind of turns on you. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, that was an idea that was not mine, but um, we kind of just played with it and experimented with it in every location, and uh, we weren't entirely sure if it would make it into the series, but it worked. So, you know, and it gives you that sense that he's globetrotting, you know, he's just sort of um, running around the planet, uh, finding all these connections. So it was fun. And, and the forest, um, did you, um, the, you have all these green, I grew up in a forest. I grew up in a place in France called Fontainebleau and uh, I, I had always a lot of, when I started photography, I had lots of problems getting the forest. So, um, the, um, but it's some very, very nice colors. And I really think in the beginning, you know, you really think, oh, he's in a studio. There's a big palm there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the setup with the, the interview, it was just kind of like, it, it's, it's hard to find. That, I think that was the hardest thing in the forest was just finding the background for his interview because it's, you know, we're kind of stuck and in, in not, we don't have a huge chunk to, to, to work in. And you think like, oh, any, any, you just point the camera at the forest and it's going to look like you're in the jungle. But when you when you point it at it, it's like it doesn't. It doesn't always work that way. So you kind of have we had to find the backgrounds that work, and then you're also parallaxing with the because we had a Dana Dolly out there, and we're doing this. So you, you're seeing this way into the forest, you're seeing that way into the forest, and you're seeing that way into the forest. So all three of those backgrounds needed to work and needed to look believable 
or you know they need to sell some idea that he's in the forest and we can only go as far as our extension cords because yeah. we're lighting it. We so. had like 50 feet, I think we, yeah. So we didn't, we didn't have too much to go, but we just kind of found that one and that, that palm looked good. And it was, it just kind of was like, okay, yeah, this looks, this looks like jungle. We walked around with the camera for a while and just tested it. Yeah. Just kept experimenting. And yeah, you think that you can just point it anywhere, but when you're that close to it, a lot of it, you know, and because we were on an area that wasn't forested, it was this little camp, the stuff that's directly there, sometimes it could just look like sticks and, and brush. And so we really wanted to have like a palm or something that really says rainforest. And I think you did a great job figuring it out. Yes. And a very, very beautiful, very well shot, very nice narrative. So very, very, um, uh, very enjoyable to watch actually. And, and uh, it's a nice, it's a, it's a nice story. It's an incredible story, really, that you have. Uh, you know, so we, I definitely learned something I didn't know about Atto before you sent us there. Right. Uh, so uh, something about the uh, uh, the um, uh, the people at Atto and the Max Planck Institute that are uh, very very uh, organized and uh, very nice. Actually, they really gave us a lot of information. Can you tell us more about uh, Anto, what, 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 what do they do and how is it organized? Uh, because I think we should really say, you know. Yeah, uh, they were amazing. Um, so it's, it's this tiny camp, but they have, um, you know, two little structures there. Uh, first of all, we took, we flew into Manaus. Um, then we took a very long car ride um, into the jungle. Then we got on the boat, then we went down the river for a while, and then we got off and we took more cars further into the jungle, and then you reach their camp. And, um, the, you know, it's run by a group of Brazilians. Um, a lot of the scientists are German, but everyone who runs that camp is Brazilian, and some of the scientists are Brazilian as well, and they were the warmest, most amazing people. Um, they cook every meal there. They have a small kitchen. There's running water. There's toilets. So it's better than Chad in that way. Um, but we were and showers, showers, showers. Are the best. Yeah. yeah, there were showers. That was the perk. Um, but they were incredible. They were so welcoming and warm and there's a little kitchen structure and then there's the sleeping structure. That's just a room with, you know, sort of a, a screened in porch kind of room with a ton of hammocks all just next to each other lined up again, like little sardines. Yeah. That was the theme throughout. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's a very organized place and they have scientists that are working at that camp where they're doing their calculations and working on the data that they're collecting. And then they also go to the tower every day, which is just a little bit further down the Sturt Road. And the tower is collecting measurements and data about a lot of things, not just the dust. It's about clouds. It's about moisture and condensation and rain and weather. And it's measuring so many things that are relevant to our climate and climate change that are incredibly important. And so the, the data is constantly collecting data, uh, the tower is constantly collecting data through all sorts of fine instruments that are on top of it. And people, you know, go to the computers at the base of the tower and collect this data every day and use it for all sorts of studies and things. And um, it's incredible because it's in the middle of nowhere and it's gathering vital information about how our ecosystem works and um, what the climate's doing and there's just a group of a tiny group of amazing people who work there and live there and run it and um, they were they were wonderful to us yeah it can be very disruptive having a film crew come in and you know because we demand a lot of control in those situations and it's tough because they're 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 doing important work and our work is is important but it's you know it's, we're not we're guests yeah we're guests and so it's it's they were just extremely accommodating and you know, it's a lot more mouths to feed as well for the, for the staff that's cooking for everybody. And the food was incredible. And we always, you know, there was never like a, we never starved. We never were thirsty. It was really, it was great. It was really, yeah. And Stefan was very good on camera. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. He was like, yeah, you show and Yeah. You never really know if scientists can be, you know, sometimes introverted and, you know, there, there's a reason that they work in their field and sometimes they, you know, they don't want to be on camera 
and he just lit right up. You know, as soon as we as soon as we started talking to him, he was a great character. Yeah, we we had limited conversations with him beforehand because we were all very busy and he was busy, and um, we knew that he was a great expert for this, but. I didn't have a great sense of how he was going to be on camera until I met him and um, he was wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And Latif's very conversational and so intelligent. He can, you know, talk about pretty much anything with anybody. So as soon as he gets onto a, a topic that he's really interested in, he, he kind of Yeah, they really, out, they hit it off. Yeah. They had a great um, rapport and the way they were talking about the jungle looking like broccoli and salad mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. all that. It was, yeah, it was really fun. Yeah, that was cool. Are you coming back to Brazil? I would love to. I yeah. love Brazil. I've been to Brazil um, three different times now. That was my third time in Brazil. Um, but right now, I think that where we live and where you live are struggling a lot with, uh, with this terrible pandemic. So hopefully not too far in the future, we can all be traveling to see each other again. Yeah. Please, let's find a vaccine for COVID because I can't stand it. My children can't stand it. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, it's, uh, there could be something about connected. You know, we're all connected with uh, this pandemic. So. Yeah. Well, it was kind of funny the timing when it came out that it's, you know, you feel like you, you want to distance away, but you're also being taught that the world is completely connected and, and this series kind of helps prove yeah. it in a lot of different ways. I think the series hopefully puts a positive spin on that. Um, I think we're all learning right now or being reminded that we're all connected in ways uh, we don't normally think about. The, the ways that we behave and our actions affect the people around us and people even in different countries around the world. And um, that's maybe a little scary as a notion right now with the pandemic, but I think Latif and this program really show all the very beautiful and positive ways yeah. that we're all connected. So yeah. I hope people watch it and, and get that and have that be their takeaway. Do you have some uh, uh, feedback on, you know, how people are, people are around you and, and what, what are they saying? Or are you getting lots of brownie points from your yeah. A lot of people are watching it and texting about it. We have a bunch of friends and family that love it. And yeah, Latif um, actually sent a very nice email the other day to everyone who worked on it because he gets the most feedback, obviously, being the host. People are tweeting to him and writing him, and he's gotten people from so many different countries around the world who have watched some of the episodes multiple times, have been inspired by them, teachers who want to use them in different lessons in their classrooms, um, all sorts of fun feedback. And actually, today in the New York Times, there's a profile of Latif um, so hopefully even more people will, will read it and want to take a look at the series, but I think it's, uh, I think it's doing well so far. Well, uh, you know, I think you said a lot and, uh, it's been really, really interesting and it's been great working with you and uh, the whole team loved working on that project and it's been very, very special for us. Um, and, um, and, it's great that the project is, you know, it really works well. It's, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, you know, I hope my, my, my children will switch out of uh, Teen Titans and switch to <laughs> uh, Because with pandemic, children are only watching, you know, all these comics. So um, yeah. you know, maybe Netflix could do something, you know, you know, a, a bug and something, you know, there's something interesting and where they learn something. But um, yeah, uh, I think it's the a very kid friendly show. Latif is very funny and uh, he makes science really approachable for a wide audience. So yeah, tell them to watch it. <laughs> I will get them. Thank you so much and uh, stay safe and please come back to Brazil and, uh, and uh, great work. And um, uh, you know, hopefully you'll be back in Brazil or, or, or we, um, uh, and great uh, next I'm looking forward to the next projects you're going to do yeah. yeah same here and thank you to Fernando and to Lati and Douglas and everybody from your team we absolutely couldn't have done it without them no so they were we appreciate it yeah invaluable to us they were so great thank you. Pleasure. and uh, thank you for calling us absolutely. yeah thanks for taking an interest take care thank you bye-bye okay bye. bye so this was Alice Walsh 
director and Christopher Gill, DOP on Connected, The Hidden Science of Everything, presented by Latif Nasser and showing right now on Netflix. That was a great hour and I would like to thank Eric Osterholm at 0.0, .0 to make this interview possible. And I would also like to thank the team at the Max Planck Institute in Vienna and Stefan Wolf and Aris Mubius for being so diligent in helping us planning this shoot. If you want to know more about filming in Brazil, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also check our website and subscribe to our newsletter. We try our best to provide information for you to come and film Brazil. On this note, bye and see you soon. Thank you very much.